Hey gang, welcome back to another video here on JoeChem. Okay gang, so if you're watching this video, I'm assuming you've seen the regiochemic the regiochemistry basics video for the oxymercuration, demercuration, and the hydroboration oxidation reactions. In most cases, most of the students I've worked with, you just need to know how to use those reactions. You know how to predict the products, maybe not even know about the stereochemical consequences or, you know, reflect stereochemistry in those reactions. You just need to actually predict the new, you know, atom to atom bonds, the regiochemistry, right? However, if you're here, that means you probably need to know a little bit more about the hydroboration oxidation reaction, but you're in the right place. Don't worry. It's not a bad mechanism. It'll help us predict any type of reaction, you know, that we will do with hydroboration oxidations. So just promise, or I, I promise you, trust me, it's not that bad. Okay, so if we take a look right here, I want to step through the mechanism of this right here because it really reflects many of the uh, considerations or things you'll need to know about this reaction. So if we see here, we have this lovely uh, cyclohexene derivative with this methyl group. The hydroboration oxidation, it'll be a first step of boron. You may see it as B2H6. Don't worry, as long as there's boron involved, you know you're you know doing a hydroboration oxidation. THF may be included, it may not, it's just a solvent. And the second step will always have hydrogen peroxide, that's a must, and you will see a source of hydroxide as well as water, okay? So what you're gonna see is, remember, we do an anti-Markovnikov addition of water. That means we're going to put an OH on the lesser substituted carbon in our double bond. There's no shifts or anything like that. And there's absolutely no reason why you know, this attaches a wedge, it can attach as a dash, because as you can see, we, we're dealing with sp2 carbons. You'll see in the mechanism, there's no difference as to whether we attach this way or this way. However, what does matter, and you'll see, is on the other carbon that does not receive the OH, you're going to be putting a hydrogen on that carbon. That must be on the same side as the oxygen, the OH, right, uh, that you attach. So it is very important to note that this is a syn addition, and you will see how that can man manifest itself in complete the reaction questions to try to trip you up, but we're super smart, so they ain't gonna trip us up. All right, so if we take a look, I'm, I'm gabbing. If we take a look at the mechanism, we just introduce our organic piece right here. The very first step, let me just take a peek. Okay, so the very first thing is that you're going to have your BH3. Now it's important to note boron being one of, the, one of those loonies in the third column of the periodic table, it has an empty P or like, you know, it has, uh, you know, empty valence sh uh, electron shell potential, right? It can accept a bond. So what's going to happen is the lesser substituted carbon in this double bond will command the two electrons in the double bond right here. It will reach out and it will start to bond to boron. It can accept the electrons. This is the carbon. It's going to take the electrons, right? Very Markovnikov addition-esque because that leaves this carbon right here without electrons, but it's the more substituted carbon. So if we have to have one of these two, you know, lose electrons, BSOL, down the river without a paddle, it's gonna be the tertiary carbon over the secondary carbon, right? The more substituted over the less loses the electrons. However, in this same mechanistic move, we have two electrons from here. So basically borons accepting electrons, and at the same time, this hydrogen is gonna to think to itself, okay, I start to see a positive carbon appear here, well, I'm gonna take these two electrons, I'm going to act as hydride, right? So think of this, and I'm going to bond right here. So you can see it's really the lesser substituted carbon taking these electrons bonding to boron. As this carbon loses electrons, this hydrogen is gonna say, you know what? I'm gonna take these two electrons, I'm gonna make a move, and I'm going to attach to that carbon right there. So right away, what you're gonna see is why this is in syn addition in the first place, is once we make this move, Right, we're attaching, we're interacting with the double bond, we're interacting with on the same face of the double bond with boron attaching and this hydride attaching. So I'm gonna use wedges, but we absolutely could use dashes. You know, we're going to have a wedged B, wedged boron with two hydrogens, as well as this hydride now attached here. So if I'm drawing this as a wedge, I'm going to draw this hydride, sorry, yeah, the, the H attaching out asterisk it right here as a wedge. So this hydrogen that I'm drawing is a wedge, and that means that this once planar CH3, right, it was planar in this position, it's going to be a dash. And again, if I was drawing the inverse, if I was drawing the opposite, this would be a dash, this would be a dash, that would be a wedge. Okay, 
Now, from there, uh, almost as an aside, at, while this is going on, what you're going to get, so that's kind of step one. So when step two starts, there's a mini initiation step that has to happen. The hydrogen peroxide interacts with the hydroxide up here, and all that's going to happen is hydroxide, and again, I'm drawing this just because I'm, you know, limited real estate on the whiteboard, is going to deprotonate the hydrogen peroxide. So I would say before you even bring in the hydrogen peroxide, you have this lovely deprotonated hydrogen peroxide species, okay? So that is what is going to make an appearance. Now, again, I think you can see the negative oxygen is nucleophilic in nature, right? It is a hub of negative charge. If it sees anything positive, it's gonna go for it, right? Well, boron, yet again, has potential to accept electrons, accept a bond. So right here, we get an attack of the negative oxygen in the deprotonated hydrogen peroxide on that boron. Okay? So once we, I'm just double checking because this mechanism does get a little bit weird. Also, the way I'm drawing it, if you're, if you do it, the, there's kind of two different ways to draw this, where you kind of add boron three times or you interact with boron three times. If that's the way your professor does it, feel free to do it, but this is also an accepted uh, way to draw the mechanism as well. So at this point, right, I still have this dashed methyl group. I have the wedged hydrogen. And now I have, I'm going to draw uh, boron and we have oxygen OH like this. So here, so, and right, boron from the third column. Now boron has a negative charge because it has four bonds from the third column. So three minus one, two, three, four from all four bonds, negative one formal charge. Here's the weirdest part of this mechanism, and it has to deal with some bonding, anti-bonding, orbital nonsense, not nonsense, but um, stuff, and it deals with the fact that oxygen-oxygen bonds are super weak, but what's going to happen is this carbon is going to take its bond, and it's going to instead move it to bond with oxygen. Let me make sure I get this electron arrow. I have it written down just to make sure I don't screw it up. Yeah, so this is going to move over here, so basically, carbon's gonna say, I'm taking the two electrons, boron, you're losing a bond, which boron's okay with, because that's one less bond for boron, it'll go back to being neutral, and it's going to instead make a bond to oxygen here, and at the same time, we boot off this hydroxide right here. I know it's not a great leaving group, but you'll see why that works out. So, we do that right there. Nothing changing up top, that is just hanging out, the CH3 and the wedged hydrogen. Now we have a wedged, right? Still a wedged. Nothing changed on that front. Let me draw this a little bit longer. But we're no longer attached to boron. We are attached to this oxygen, okay? And the weirdest part is this oxygen is still attached to the BH2. So we still have this going on right here. And to expand this, boron no longer has a negative charge because boron's back to having three bonds, which it is totally cool with. So now I hope you can start to see where we're getting this from, right? So really, we put on boron, we have this bond kind of migrate, similar to like a hydride shift, if you will. And now we, we're getting closer to what we need. And at this point, now that we have an oxygen-boron bond, right? As we did before, boron has a partial positive charge. The hydroxide, we just booted off, this one right here. It will come back, it will say, you know what? Coming back with a vengeance, I see that partially positive boron. I'm going to attack it because I'm negative and it's partial positive. When we do that, the leaving group is in fact these electrons, and they're gonna get dumped onto oxygen, and that oxygen is totally cool with that because it is a fan of negativity. So, if I'm gonna try and squeeze this all in one on one space, uh, so we, we do get this weird, you know, BH2OH species up here. We don't really care so much about that. We care about this right here. Uh, I'm gonna go and erase this, because I'm gonna draw this a little, uh, and we'll see, we'll see if I can just make things fit. So then we have this wedged O minus. And finally, if you were wondering, okay, well we used everything up here except for the water. Now it's time for water to shine. Water is our source of cleanup protons here. So we go ahead and snatch it up, dump electrons onto there. And I'm lazy, I'm not gonna redraw it. And we finally get our product. So gang, what's really important, what's the takeaway here? Because it is a weird mechanism. 
I think the most important part, unless you actually have to draw this you know, verbatim, if you're predicting the product, the most important thing to realize is that when you add across the double bond, you're going to have a boron here, and then whatever's attached to the boron, whether it be hydrogens or deuteriums, that ends up next door and on the same side of your ring. So now what I want to do is, you know, you can take this in if you will, uh, if you want to. I hope so. But uh, I'm going to erase this. I want to do. I want to do one example, but I want to show you how it can be the same reactant can be have similar but slightly different kind of uh, hydro boration oxidation conditions. How you can get different products. And we'll call it a video. Okay, gang. To round out this video, we have three problems. It's the same reactant. It's essentially the same conditions. But you know, if you're here, hope. You know, I'm assuming that means you need a deep understanding of this reaction. So I want to show you any which way someone might try to trip you up uh, in this reaction because you can just change little things in different sections or areas of the reagents and you get different products, okay? So if we take a look right here, the first reaction, you know, up here, it's just the standard reaction, right? It's just, you have your alkene, BH3, THF, right? Just, you know, you're doing a hydroboration oxidation reaction, that's your solvent, and you see, you know, your standard hydrogen peroxide, sodium hydroxide, and water, okay? So remember, this is just very straightforward. We know our regiochemistry is we're gonna be putting our OH on that carbon right here because we're, you know, we're ox putting an OH on the lesser substituted carbon. But remember, this is a lovely sin addition. So if your stereochemistry matters, make sure to reflect that. So what I would almost recommend, remember, is you know, that you're gonna have your BH3, oh, HH. We know the double bond is going to grab this, and this is going to grab the more substituted carbon. We have that type of yin and yang thing going on. So I'd almost draw the intermediate, and the intermediate looks like this. Feel free to do this wedge or dash. I'm gonna do wedge, but you get your BH2 like this, which means I have to put a wedged OH here. And yes, stereochemistry matters. So you can see I'm attached to a methyl group. This is tight, uh, attached to an isopropyl group and this is attached to an ethyl group. So adding a hydrogen here means this carbon is attached to four different things. I'll draw this all with straight lines, but I definitely have a tetrahedral you know, you know, situation going on. I have to show not just two lines in the plane of whatever I'm writing on, but a wedge and a dash. So what I'm going to do is by default, I need to make sure that this hydrogen I'm adding is a wedge. So this has to be a wedge, and just because it's the smallest group, I'm going to dash the methyl. So this is all just to draw the initial state. And we know that through the deprotonated hydrogen peroxide attack and the bond migrating, this turns into an OH. So your answer over here is the following. H and wedge, right? Because the two things you add, the H and the OH, that is a syn addition, same side, there you go. Now, what happens if we change right below? I think you're gonna see there's two situations where we see you know, deuterium written in blue. How does that affect our product over here? So remember, this would be, this would affect the first step. This would affect this right here. So instead of BH bonds, you have BD bonds. So be careful, this is someone being a stinker and is trying to get you. So, almost tracking the deuterium, we know nothing really changes as for the chemistry that happens on this carbon right here. However, we're not sticking an H on like we are up here, we're sticking a deuterium, a D. So everything remains the same, but your final product looks like this. Wedged OH, and, and what I should do is, since this is the only stereochemistry we're dealing with, I can write plus an antimer Right, because these could be two wedges and this be a, uh, a, sorry, these two dashes and this wedge. But down here, right, instead of a wedged hydrogen, I have a wedged deuterium, okay? So that's how someone can throw you a curveball, okay? And again, plus an antimer. And last but not least, this is almost like the, uh, I always, I hate when teachers do this or anyone writing a question does this, but it's fair game, it's fair game. So remember how water at the very end had its moment where it was our source of H plus. Well, here's our source of D plus. So remember, we get all the way to having something like this. Uh, 
uh, what is this? This would be an H because, right, this is an H. And we have wedged O minus. But at this point, it's not water that comes in. It's D2O that comes in. So your final product, the way it changes from these lovely ones above, we have this. Here I'm drawing the, you know, I have the wedged OH because this, or sorry, the wedged H because that's a hydrogen. But down here, uh, it rears its head again, an OD, O deuterium. Okay, gang, if you were looking for a deeper understanding or context of the oxymercury, sorry, whew, wrong reaction, the hydroboration oxidation reaction, I hope you found it here. I hope the mechanism made sense. I hope these complete the reaction questions made sense. I hope these potential curveballs made sense. You think to yourself, no curveballs are going to trick me, and they shouldn't because we stepped through the reaction mechanism and we saw how the various scenarios could change our outcomes. If you're watching this video, uh, you're using Joachim, and I'm so happy and humbled that you are. If you have any questions, leave a comment below. If you want to say hi, leave a comment below. Uh, please like and subscribe. And if anything, I hope to see you all in the next video.